Bible is tough to understand. We're returning to our, well, not returning, we're already back. We're continuing our series through the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, these are the words, these are the words that Moses preached to the Israelite people as they're about to enter into the land. A sermon he, can't, he preaches to call them back into relationship with him and show them how they might live that out. Uh, and um, today we're coming to probably one of the trickiest, most confronting passages in the book and probably in the whole Bible. Uh, and so before we just jump straight into the reading, I thought I'd give uh, some context and, and help us uh, orientate ourselves. Um, so we're reading uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 13 to 30. And this, um, uh, this comes in the part of the book that's looking at uh, sexual infidelity or what does uh, a godly sex in the, in, and marriage look like in the nation of Israel as they enter into the land. Now, to con- context in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we, we're kind of following along the book as it follows the Ten Commandments, and the, kind of the commandment that's corresponding to this one is the commandment, you must not commit adultery. Speaking of a person's right uh, to uh, sexual integrity, uh, there's, there's phrases used in the passage like, you must purge evil from Israel. And it shows a deep concern for the holiness of the people of Israel. It's a phrase that's used throughout the book, but it comes up quite a bit here. And it demonstrates God's concern for what will really destroy and, and degrade society. It talks about uh, the death penalty in here. Again, uh, kind of foreign to our experience and setting in 21st century um, Australia. Uh, and it's, it's quite harsh, uh, but it's to be read as a, a de- deterrent from that kind of behavior. Uh, and then kind of thinking context in the ancient Near East, so the, the area, the context, the historical setting that this passage is written into it's important to remember that it's written, written to a time and space where women had no rights. Uh, women were property to be used and um, make families with or, or whatever, and uh, they didn't have a voice, certainly in, in the areas around Israel at the time and the, the kind of settings that Deuteronomy was speaking into and the other nations that already um, were in the land and, and around Israel the land. Uh, yeah, like the, there was um, no rights for women. So what it, we will read in a minute kind of speaks into that context. We remember that. Um, it's also speaking in context in, in Israel and what's expected of a husband and a community to protect a family. So we remember that context as well. And also Context for here at Hills, like how have we come here and what's, um, what's this moment look like for us? And I recognize I am a man speaking on a passage that addresses a lot of issues around women. And I don't take that lightly. Uh, we met as an eldership uh, quite some time ago. I was meant to do this sermon in August, but it, it, it didn't, and that's fine. But we met um, some time ago as an eldership which comprises of men and women, to work through this passage and kind of discern this together. Um, I've shared this sermon with others, with uh, elders and some others, um, uh, women in our community, uh, to get some feedback and, and, um, uh, and, and so I guess, some help on that. Uh, so thank you to those. And we, we, we talked about whether it would be uh, most appropriate if a woman might preach this sermon, um, but decided that, this, this is something that I, as the pastor and the um, spiritual teacher of this community, uh, would cover and lead us into understanding and applying this really tricky passage. So, um, yeah, all this to say, this, this passage we're about to read is quite confronting. Um, it addresses issues of sexual assault, adultery, consent, divorce, domestic abuse, 
women's rights. And to read it plainly, it will not sit well with us. Uh, it will, without context and, and careful thought, it will disturb us. Um, so just bear that in mind as we read. But with context and understanding, my prayer is that we'll see that ultimately this passage is about God's deep concern for women, deep concern for family, and deep concern for holiness uh, in, amongst his people. So, and also to say, um, during this sermon, like, obviously, gosh, it's heavy already. <laughs> um, if people need to step out, that's fine. Or even if a few people want to strategically go just help themselves to a glass of water or go to the toilet. So, it's completely normal just to step out. That's fine. Like, please do. And if you need um, uh, any kind of support, please reach out um, to myself or any elders um, here. So with that, let's, let's read. If you have a Bible, open up to Deuteronomy 22, verse 13. And um, <laughs> it's just like already people are like, whoa. <laughs> See, this is why we had some context uh, before we read it. I, I should also say, like, we don't want to avoid the tricky passages. Because all, all of God's word, all scripture is God breathed. It's God's very word. Used for teaching, training, correcting uh, in all righteousness. So we believe that, and and we, with that in mind, uh, let me read this passage for us. If a man takes a wife and after sleeping with her dislikes her and slanders her and gives her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity. Then a young woman's father and mother shall bring to the town elders at the gate proof that she was a virgin. Her father will say to the elders, I gave my daughter in marriage to this man, but he dislikes her. Now he has slandered her and said, I will not find your daughter to be a virgin. But here is proof of my daughter's virginity. Then her parents shall display the cloth before the elders of the town, and the elders shall take the man and punish him. They shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the young woman's father because this man excuse me, has given an Israelite virgin a bad name. She shall continue to be his wife. He must not divorce her as long as he lives. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house and there the men of the town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who has slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help. And the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge evil from among you. But if out in the country a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the woman. She has committed no sin deserving death. This case is like that of someone who attacks and murders a neighbor. For the man found the young woman out in the country, and though the betrothed woman screamed, there was no one to rescue her. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. A man is not to marry his father's wife. He must not dishonor his father's bed. Now let me pray before we get into this. Heavenly Father, we just acknowledge that this is a really tricky passage with a lot going on. And uh, Lord, I just I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide me today. I thank you for the work you've done in me and, and those others uh, preparing this uh, and working through this together. And Lord, we pray you would um, reveal your heart through your word. Lord, give us understanding by your Spirit of this passage to see what's behind these words of your love, your deep concern for the vulnerable, for families, uh, for people. 
And Lord, in all this, we pray that uh, you would give us that same heart and same love and concern uh, to, for your people and for justice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's two things, two main things going on in this passage. There's the preservation of family and the protection of family. And the first thing is the preservation of family, like preserving uh, the, the family unit, husband and wife. And, uh, and I, like I mentioned before, like penalty is used quite a lot in this passage, purging the evil from Israel. Uh, people who commit adultery or sex outside of that marriage covenant are to be stoned to death. And that, again, that's quite confronting, uh, particularly in our context uh, for, for that kind of behavior to be stoned. And, and one way to read uh, this passage and throughout Deuteronomy, when the death penalty is used, that kind of demonstrates how significant and serious this issue is. And it's read to be a deterrent from, uh, from um, doing this behavior. It's not in that in this instance, it's not an issue of justice in the sense that other passages like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you kill someone and, and, that, and you, you uh, get killed because that's, that's a justice issue. This is about um, purging this kind of behavior from Israel. God doesn't want adultery and promiscuous behavior and people sleeping around, and, and which was very prevalent in other cultures. God didn't want that for Israel, for his people. He didn't want it to become normal. Because God was concerned with the long-term preservation of Israel society and the pres- preservation of the family. Because the social impact of these practices, sex before marriage and breaking up families uh, by, by having sex outside of marriage and um, uh, breaking those units up, has a big impact now you can imagine a young girl in that society, in a, in a patriarchal society, to, to um, have sex before marriage, get pregnant, and um, out of wedlock, there's no security for her. There's no support. There's no husband to take care of her, in, again, in that context. There's no opportunity for her to own land and to provide for her own child. And it pushes the woman and the child deeper into poverty, and it creates cycles of poverty. Or or another example, if a family is torn apart because the husband leaves leaves his wife to pursue a relationship with someone else, that that woman that he leaves is left without support, without um, security, without opportunity to provide for her and her family. Again, it just creates cycles of poverty. And history has has shown this to be true. Um, the National Fatherhood Initiative uh, did uh, research over 60 years in America, so American stats, but it showed that the breaking up of families, and particularly the lack of a father, to, to sorry statistically, uh, people are four times have a four time greater risk of leaving in poverty without if they grow up without a father. They're more likely to go to prison. They're more likely to experience uh, abuse and neglect. They're more likely to abuse drug and alcohol. They're more likely to drop out of school. They're seven times more likely to get pregnant or to get someone else pregnant as a teenager. Now, that's not to say that a a child of a single parent is deficient or, um, uh, or is in a whole lot of trouble because there's always exceptions, and no person is a statistic. And there's some amazing single mums and dads in this community who are incredible and doing a fantastic job. And with all the challenges and pressures that they're experiencing are some of the most committed and faithful in our community. Amazing doing a brilliant job. And, and our, my prayer is that the church would step up and, and provide that family and, and uh, the, 
uh, yeah, that family need that they, that they have. But this highlights the need of a stable family and the impact that can have when people are unfaithful and families broken. So there's social concern uh, in this passage for what is the impact of, of the breaking up of family or when family isn't preserved. But there's also a spiritual concern going on uh, around sex and what's, what's its place within society, what's its place within relationships. And it's important to, to remember we are made in the image of God. And so we have a humanity, we have an identity that is sacred and profoundly important. And sexual Im- intimacy is, is giving all of yourself to someone. And it's something not to be taken, and it's something to be protected. And the place where God has designed and and gifted sexual intimacy, uh, where we can give ourselves entirely without fear of rejection, confident that the other person is putting you first as you put them first, is in marriage. And what God ordained uh, for men and women together. To get that sexual gratification outside of marriage is to come compromise, to break that sacred space, is to take something that's not your own. And even, you know, in our day and age, even uh, digital images and videos, pornography, it's harmless. It's kind of the, the, the narrative of our society is that it's fine. It's just you. There's, there's no impact. But, but again, what research is showing more and more is that it's corroding society, men and women. It's, it's been devastating to mental health, particularly in men. But also it's been victimizing women and in, in increasing, there's increasing rates of sexual violence. It's not harmless. It's deeply harmful to individuals, to men and to women and to all of society. God has got a greater plan for sex and sexuality that's bigger than just getting pleasure. But there's the question of, okay, well, what if I never get married? Does that mean that I, I can never experience that? Well, marriage is something that's good that points forward to something that's great. That total commitment, that giving of ourselves exclusively and entirely to one other person, the promise of love, care, protection, connection, as long as we live, is a sign of how God relates to his people. Marriage is used as an analogy of how God relates to his people, Israel, and later how God relates to the church. There is something better than marriage, something better than sex, And that is the intimacy we can experience with God. There is only one marriage in heaven. There's only one marriage, and that's between God and all of his people. And so marriage is to be preserved, and God is deeply concerned about that in the nation of Israel. But the other thing going on in this passage is the protection of family. So their family is to be preserved. There's also to be protected, as in the people in the family are to be protected, particularly, particularly women. Now, we read this, again, with our, our 21st century lenses, and we think, wow, this is so degrading to women. But reading carefully and understanding the context It's actually the other way around. This is profoundly protective of women, particularly women. So particularly if we look at uh, passages like 13 to 19, where it speaks of if a a, a man takes a wife, he's unhappy with her. Now, in normal context, he could just divorce her, just drop her, get rid of her. Like, I can find a better option out there. And there's, there's easy excuses he can make that she doesn't please him. Or if, if he could accuse her of not being a virgin, he could accuse her of breaking that commandment of preserving marriage. And then, and then that's it. She's gone. 
I can move on, the man can move on and find something, someone else. But what this passage talks about in bringing, bringing it to the elders, bringing evidence of virginity, that kind of stuff, it actually it gives an opportunity for justice for the womb. It gives the woman a voice. In a culture where women don't have voice and don't have an opportunity to defend themselves, it gives them an op- a voice. They're not an inanimate object in this scenario. This is a woman with autonomy. They can speak for themselves. They can speak justice for themselves. And the expectation as they bring that to the elders, uh, to the, the, the judges and the leaders within the community, is that these elders are to seek justice, seek justice for the vulnerable. That's the command given to the elders elsewhere in Deuteronomy, is there to seek justice. Now, if, um, if it comes out that the woman is not, sorry, is a virgin, the man is, is trying to get out of this marriage and drop her, uh, you know, he's fined, and he must remain married to the woman. And, and again, we think, hang on, he's tried to drop her. He's tried to get rid of her. And yet they're forced to remain married in that context. For us, that sounds outrageous. But in that context, it's protecting her. Because if she were to leave, she'd be left without protection, without security in that culture and context. And the elders are responsible for holding the man uh, accountable for for his behavior and uh, facilitating repentance and love rather than abusive behavior or neglect. The community protects the entirety of the family. Uh, moving a, a bit further on, there's the passage from verse 23. If, uh, if a man happens to meet, a, meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, uh, you shall take both them to the gate and they be stoned to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help. Now again, the, uh, confronting, but that last line... Uh, and she did not scream for help. There's a sense that, uh, you know, this woman is in a situation where uh, someone sexually assaults her or rapes her. Uh, in other cultures and settings, there's nothing that she can do. It's a horrible experience for women in, in, um, in, in ancient cultures, ancient times. But here... But she can scream out. She can cry out. Like this woman has a voice. And there's a sense that, in, you know, in, in uh, Israelite, Israelite cities, towns are very close together. Uh, buildings, sorry, are very close together. She can cry out. And there's a sense that the whole town and community are ready to come in and protect her. Uh, the, the whole weight of the justice system of the city is ready to intervene and stop this. And it's saying that the woman can say no, can resist. And she's got the whole weight of the town behind her. And so this is, this is talking about consent. If, if a woman is not consenting and this happens to her, she has a voice. She has uh, autonomy. She is to be protected. And so they're brought before the gates, and that's, that's where the elders are. That's, so they're brought before the elders again. And again, it's implied, it doesn't say explicitly, but we know it's implied that it's brought before the elders to discern. And again, they're to, be, they're to judge with justice. And uh, even further, in verse 25 to 27 is the scenario what if it's out in the country and there's there's no one to hear her voice to hear her if she cries out they err on the side of the woman like there's no there's no opportunity to provide any sort of evidence so they it's just assumed uh, that there wasn't consent and the man is held accountable but the woman is protected in that scenario And in, in verse 28, again, another <laughs> confronting passage for us, where if a man meets a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they're discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver and he must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. For us, that seems horrible. Horrible. The crime is against the woman. 
And then she's forced to be with the one who assaulted her. But if he were stoned to death, if he were to be punished as is required, then she would be left with nothing. She wouldn't be a virgin, and that would compromise her uh, future marriages. That would shame her in the culture and setting. And so to force the man to marry her and protect her and to provide for her is, is a protection for this woman. This is a tough one for modern Christians, but it shows us that God is more concerned that she is properly protected, given shelter, food, and income throughout her entire life for her and her children. Otherwise, she would be banished and not being worthy of marriage anymore. This is not justifying sexual assault. It's God giving women autonomy, identity, and dignity and trying to prevent women from being cast out of society after being violated in a scenario where they had uh, no control, no options. All of this in context, I hope you can see, is about the protection of women and the protection of family. And it's not, it's not that men step in and protect women, that men come in and uh, protect women and women are helpless, And it's not seeing women as victims or objects like other cultures see them. But this is about seeing them as people who have their own voice, identity, and dignity. God is deeply concerned with the vulnerable. And it's up to the whole community to uphold them. God is deeply concerned about the the preservation of family and the protection of family. Now, having read this and, and, and thought a bit more about it um, and, and the Hebrew and the Israelite context that we've heard, there's a story in the New Testament that kind of relates directly to this passage. And that's in John 8 and the story where a, someone who's caught in adultery, caught in the act, is brought before Jesus. And let me read that story. Jesus... At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and Jesus, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said to him, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now in this story, this woman is caught in adultery and, and, you know, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they point straight to Deuteronomy 22 and it's like, we've got to stone her. And they bring her to Jesus. But there's a few issues in this passage. And the first one is, where's the man in this story? So he's caught in the act. It takes two to tango. Where's the man? And she's brought before in the temple courts, probably naked, like an utterly shamed and degraded. And she's brought as a, a tool, an object to use to test Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord don't value her, don't give her an identity or dignity. She's just a pawn in their game. But Jesus, after sending all the Pharisees away through his challenging question, statement, let the sinless person throw the first stone, they all leave. Jesus talks directly to her. He, talk, he asks her a question. He gives her a voice. 
And Jesus, as the, the author behind the law in Deuteronomy, he captures the heart of this law. Protection and preservation. He speaks directly to her. He honors her. He doesn't condemn her, but he also calls her to something greater. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, if you've made mistakes, taken what's not yours, or what is yours has been taken, Jesus loves you. He knows you. He cares deeply for you. He holds you high and values you beyond measure. He cares for you and he calls the church, his community, his body to care for you too. And so I want to think about, well, how, how do we apply this today? Because these are laws given a specific context to kind of govern the way Israelite family law is, is enacted. We, we don't operate in exactly the same way. We don't stone people for one. What do we, how can we do? What can we take from this heart of God and, and apply it in our own context, in our own lives? And as we think about what are we doing to preserve family? What are we doing to protect family, particularly women, particularly the vulnerable? Now, the church talks a lot about marriage, but we're not so great at doing much about it. Like a great, um, well, to quote a very wise woman, who's my mom, we spend a lot of time investing in weddings and very little in marriages. What are we doing to invest in and protect marriages? This is a great plug to do um, if you're not yet married and you get engaged. Do marriage prep. Go see a counselor. Go uh, come meet with me or a pastor and do that. It's important work to do. What are we doing to invest and protect marriages. Now, it'd be easy for me to, to say something like, well, don't commit adultery and, and put in the protections in place to, to avoid that kind of behavior. But I think that's not enough. What's more important, we need to fight and protect and invest in families and marriages to promote and grow healthy, committed, safe relationships. And one way that Hills Baptist is, is working and leaning into that is is getting behind the Alpha Marriage Course. Just this week, a few of the staff and members of the church went and met with Nikki and Scylla Lee, who are the uh, founders of the course. And uh, next year, in term two, we're going to be running the marriage course and, uh, and, and make that part of our normal lives, normal calendar. Uh, just like we're running Alpha, we're going to do... Uh, the marriage course. Emily and I did this course uh, in 2016. Uh, this is this is the book that we went through, and it's got all my answers and everything in it. Really interesting to go through it again this morning. <laughs> Still got stuff to work on, but um, <laughs> but it was exactly what we needed at that time to go and to invest some time thinking about the health of our marriage. We're married uh, for four years at that point. Now, many of us own cars, and the responsible ones of us take those cars and get them serviced, you know, once a year, twice a year. In the UK, it's illegal not to get your car serviced. It's that important. How much more important is it to regularly invest in our marriages? Now, even, you know, for me and Emily, I feel like we're overdue for another marriage course. And this is why I've been talking about it, uh, at least as staff for a while, and we're, while we're getting behind it. But if, like, if there is anyone passionate about this or keen to help run the marriage course or support others going to the marriage course, providing babysitting, that kind of thing, please come speak to me. I would love to hear. Like, it, it is something that I would love the whole church to get behind. Like, 
marriage is, is only one small part of family life, and I'll mention that in a sec, but it's an important part. And I think a way that we can really protect families and see the impact throughout our society. Now, the other thing to say around protecting families, in, in Deuteronomy, it talks of the elders who are responsible to keep the husbands and, by extension, the wives accountable. And I, I do believe there's a place for the church to speak into and to speak against domestic violence and coercive control. A marriage is to be safe, secure, committed, a promise to honor the other above yourself. And if that's not happening, if that's, if, if someone is not safe, it's not good to stay in that place. And it's the church's role to, to help someone get out and get support, to encourage people to seek help, to notice behaviors, to say something. Now, the church isn't the respite center and that kind of thing, but there are good support out there. So two resources for domestic and family violence information and support. So information and support, you can visit the 1-800-RESPECT website. So 1-800-1800-RESPECT.org.au. Uh, they offer 24-7 trauma-informed counseling support and information for those who are experiencing uh, domestic and family violence or, they, or those who may be supporting someone experiencing domestic family violence. There's lots of great information uh, on their website, even to provide to someone who may be concerned about red flags in their relationship. For domestic violence support in South Australia, you can call the Domestic Violence Crisis Line at 1-800-800-098. I think there's a, there's a poster at the back with that information. And that's for uh, assessment around emergency accommodation, safety support. But this is something that we want to be serious about and protect families. A tough issue. It's uncomfortable talking about it. Let me tell you. <laughs> but it's important. And we want to take it seriously. We want to protect families and marriage. But, but what about the sing those who are single? The widows, the fatherless, the motherless, orphans, those who have lost children. What are we doing to protect them and to support them and to uphold them? As part of uh, the research of this talk, I spoke with a single mom and she commented about how many ministries and how much of our language is geared towards married people and not single people. I'm, I'm, I've done that even just early in the sermon. It was really helpful conversation and really illuminated what it's like, the good and the bad that the church uh, can do and can help and not help uh, single people. And the key thing that stuck out to me was how vulnerable people can feel. The pressure of making decisions by yourself, going places, taking care of your kids, being able to provide the, the, the need for male and female role models, just putting food on the table. This is where the church can support people, can get around people. Be the community that people need. Calling people up, seeing how they're going, inviting them into things. You know, inviting them over for dinner, providing meals where that's helpful. Demonstrating the love of Christ through community. What could we do? What could we do? Now, this is a hard passage, but deep truth and a big challenge. Now, I know that this has been a hard sermon to hear, but it raises real issues for people. Uh, I expect in a group this size, there are people who have been victims of sexual assault. And there might be people in relationships where they don't have a voice. And there will be people who have failed and hurt themselves and hurt others. And we might read this passage and it, it could make us think that God is hard, brutal, uncaring. But I hope you can see that 
in this passage is a God of love, deeply concerned for justice, deeply concerned about the good of the world and society, deeply concerned about you. He's a God of forgiveness, a God of healing, a God who calls us to something great. You are not your mistakes. You are not what's been done against you. You are a child of God. What are we doing to protect and preserve families? And what impact will that have on the world? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. And even with all the trickiness of this passage, we thank you that behind it is a God who protects, a God who lifts up, a God who gives the vulnerable, the oppressed, the afflicted a voice. And Lord, we pray as your church, as your community, we would have that same heart, the heart for justice, the heart for holiness, that heart uh, to give people voices, to, to, to speak on their behalf or to listen to them where that's needed. And Lord, even just saying and praying that I acknowledge that this, that's a whole language that we've been using recently uh, to do with uh, our First Nations people and, and um, Indigenous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And Lord, we pray that we would be a people who listen, a people who listen uh, and uphold and seek the good of all people. And Lord, we pray the same for women who we know is, this is still an issue in our culture. That domestic violence and pornography and um, promiscuity is, is still a big issue in our culture. And we are not invulnerable to that. Lord, we pray for your protection of the families and marriages here at Hills Baptist. We pray uh, for... Um, your forgiveness for where we've failed, where we've strayed, and Lord, draw us back um, to your plan and your will. And Lord, in situations where there's danger, uh, where people don't have a voice, uh, Lord, we pray your protection on them. And as a church, guide us and help us uh, to support and um, protect them as well. And Lord, for, for any here, and I know there would be some, uh, that this raises real issues and uh, trauma and experiences and hurt, I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would just hear your voice of love, of concern, that you do not condemn them, that you've forgiven them, you love them, you've healed them, and you, you, will, you will heal them. And that you are a father who deeply loves us, who will protect us and will pre preserve us. Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name.